Church meetings and church prudence and philosophy of law. He is also the director of Yale Center for Law and Philosophy. And he and Ona, um, Ona Hathaway have just published The Internationalists, How a Radical Plan to Outlaw War Remade the World, a history of international law as it has evolved from the 17th century to the present. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, everyone. I, I, um, uh, thanks for having me here. Uh, the last six years, as uh, Lee mentioned, I, I, uh, my colleague and I, Ona Hathaway, have been writing this book uh, um, about uh, um, anti-war activists in the early 20th century um, uh, who courageously fought for the outlawry of war. Um, so it's really nice and refreshing to be here among the current day heroes of the anti-war movement um, to see with my own eyes what's, what's actually happening uh, rather than reading about it in, in books. Um, so when I, when I tell people that I am writing or I've written a book about how in 1928 every state in the world got together and outlawed war, they give me a very weird look, um, uh, even weirder than normal. Um, their response is usually, what do you mean, the world outlaw of war? Um, most people, and in fact, most I would say 90% of law professors have never heard of what is called the, it has many names, Kellogg-Briand Pact, the Briand-Kellogg Pact, the Kellogg Pact, the Briand Pact, the Pact of Paris, the Paris Peace Pact, the Peace Pact, but its formal name is the General Treaty for the Renunciation of War. Um, and as, 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 as the name suggests, um, the uh, treaty outlawed war between states, um, except in cases of self-defense. Um, now, part of the reason why nobody has ever heard of such an amazing thing that the world actually got together and outlawed war um, is because it is perceived to be a, such a dismal failure. Um, uh, just after three, year, three years after the um, pact was signed, Japan invaded Manchuria. Uh, three years after that, Italy invaded Ethiopia. Four years after that, Germany invaded Poland and the rest of Europe. And the war which ensued was um, at roughly five times worse than the war that had preceded it, by most estimates, 70 million lives. And of course, the pact has not stopped wars after that. There is the, of course, the Arab-Israeli conflict. There is the genocide in Rwanda, the breakup of Yugoslavia, the Korean War, the Indo-Pakistani Wars, the current wars in Syria and Yemen, Iraq. You, you, you get the picture. Um, so in, in part, the idea has been that um, the pact seems forgotten because it seems so forgettable. It seems not to have worked, or at least that's what it's supposed. Um, but the funny look that I get, I think, is not just the look of ignorance, like pe something people haven't heard of, but a kind of a look of amusement, as if you're telling somebody something which on his face seems just plainly absurd. So, like, so it's like when I tell people that the medievals used to try animals in court for crimes, which is true, they used to do that. It seems a ridiculous thing to do, right? Um, but they did. Um, and I think that the look that I often get um, is that, that sense of like, how in the world does it make sense in order to, uh, to, to outlaw war? And I think one problem is, is I think that people think that war has always been illegal, like since the dawn of time, except in cases of self-defense. So like they can't imagine what the purpose of uh, outlawing war would be if it's already, at least implicitly, illegal. Um, but another reason I think is, is that even though people might think that a treaty to outlaw war would actually outlaw war, they can't seem to imagine what good it would do. That is, it doesn't seem to be able to make a practical difference. And, and, and just, I, I will put it this way. So if you split states very crudely up into two, part, uh, two, 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 two groups, the peaceful states and the uh, warlike states, it doesn't seem like a, a treaty to outlaw war can make any difference. Why? Because the peaceful states, they're not going to go to war anyway. They're not going to care about a law not to go to war because they're peaceful. And the warlike states, well, they're warlike. They'll go to war if it's in their interests. So what are they going to care about a piece of paper? So it seems as if the, um, a law to outlaw war seems um, useless, 
So in some sense, what I want to talk about briefly today, because I only have 12 minutes, um, and so I'm going to compress a lot of information into a very short uh, space of time. Um, the philosophical question is, what could a law that outlaws war, what could that possibly do? Um, was the kellogg Grand Pact of 1928 a useless, um, idealistic, foolish thing to do, or does, did it make sense? And I would say even stronger, did it make a difference? And what I want to suggest to you very quickly um, uh, in the now the seven minutes I have left um, <laughs> is um, that, in fact, laws against war um, uh, are incredibly important. Um, they need to be defended. They have been incredibly efficacious. Um, uh, but um, we're at a very perilous time um, in, um, in history. And once we understand why, why laws against war are important, we'll see um, uh, why um, they need to be defended. OK, so let me just briefly say, the reason why I think most people don't appreciate that the outlawry of war in 1928 made an enormous difference is because they don't know what the world used to be like before 1928. In large, sense, in large part, <coughs> the problem is that the outlawry of war has been so successful in a way that it's a victim of its own success. People don't realize what the wo world used to be like. Before 1928, it was accepted, the basic principle of international law was that states had the privilege to use force. They had the right of what was called offensive war, not just defensive war, but offensive war. And what does that mean? That means that whenever states had been harmed, had their uh, rights violated, and there was no court for them to go to, and they had no other way to have their wrong righted, they had the right under international law to use force. And the rights that they had to use force were not just for the violations of the things that we think are basic today and limited, that is territorial independence and political integrity, basically self-defense, but any right at all. That is, if you could go to court to get a judgment, if you could sue somebody, you could go to war over it. If you had no alternative. So we're talking things like property damage. We're talking things like the collection of debts. We're talking dynastic claims. We're talking about inheritance. Most people don't realize that California is part of the United States, um, as is much of, actually, which, uh, in fact, all the United States, but, but, um, but, but in this case, the southwestern United States um, was because it was conquered in, between 1846 and 1848 during the Mexican-American War. But most people don't realize that the, the main legal justification used by the United States government um, to conquer California um, and invade Mexico was to collect debts. Um, the Mexico and the United States had an arbitration agreement. They had a panel. Um, there was um, $6.2 million worth of debt um, uh, assessed against Mexico. Mexico defaulted twice. And the United States went in and took California and um, um, uh, 500 square miles of, of, of Mexican territory in compensation for those debts under the argument that they had no choice. That how else were they going to get their money back? And this was all legal under international law at the time. So not only did states have the right of conquest and booty, booty being movable property on the battlefield, uh, they also had the right of gunboat diplomacy. Okay, Gunboat diplomacy meaning that if you could go to war to enforce your rights, you could threaten to go to war in order to enforce your rights. So when the gunboat came into the harbor and said, sign the treaty, or else we'll blast you out, as Commodore Perry did in Bay of Vito in Tokyo Bay in 1854. The, any treaty that was signed was valid under international law, and the violation of the treaty was itself a cause of war. There was also a license to kill, meaning not only soldiers, but sovereigns, heads of state. If they went to war, 
they could commit mass murder and could not be tried for murder or actually any criminal offense that would have been prosecutable outside of war. Finally, there was what was called the duty of impartiality. Now, what, what that means is that if you were not in the fight, if you were a neutral state, you had a duty to treat the belligerents the same. You could not give one a better deal than the other. Now, this is incredibly important. This is a, a fact which almost nobody knows, that before 1928, economic sanctions were illegal. S neutral states could not impose economic sanctions on belligerents to punish them for waging what they took to be an aggressive war. Why? Because states had the right of war, and you couldn't punish the state for the right of war. So this is what the world looked like in that pre-1928. What the outlawry of war did is it flipped all the rules on its head. It took, when the privilege to use force became the prohibition on force, all the rules that had existed that made sense of the privilege and made sense because of the privilege to use force, flipped on its ear. So if the reason why you had the right to conquest is because you had the right to, the victim had the right to uh, be compensated for the wrong, if you could no longer go to for, uh, uh, use force to right wrongs, then it would make no sense anymore for you to have the right of conquest. And in fact, right after 1928, in 1932, uh, Henry Stimson, the US Secretary of State, issued um, the famous diplomatic note saying that the United States would no longer recognize conquests because um, states no longer had the right to go to war. And this was adopted by the League of Nations and now has is just well established that states don't have the right to conquer. Um, also coerced agreements, gunboat diplomacy is not um, acceptable anymore. It is, uh, uh, duress is a, is a complete defense. Um, aggressive war is a crime. Uh, Nuremberg, though the Holocaust was prosecuted in Nuremberg, um, the, main, the main purpose of Nuremberg was to uh, hold the major Nazi war criminals responsible for preparation um, and planning of an aggressive war. It's the first time in the history of the world that any uh, uh, head of state um, was convicted for uh, waging war. Uh, and Part of the Rome Statute, as you know now, uh, 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 aggressive war is a crime. Finally, economic sanctions are not only legal, but it's the standard way in which international law is enforced. People disagree about you know, when it should be used, but we all recognize that it's obvious that under some conditions, it seems like the proper, a proper um, uh, tool in one's tool chest. Um, now this is all this all makes sense only because now war is outlawed. Now I'm just gonna uh, what I wanna what I wanna I'm, I'm just gonna f um, um, uh, finish up right now and just say one of the points that's really important is not only for to see one that law against war is is not only useful but is actually incredibly useful um, because it's the foundation of the global legal order, but protecting the, uh, the, the outlawry of war is so vital because it's not one rule among many. It is the foundation, it is the linchpin of the entire global legal order. You pull that out, you destabilize that, you destabilize everything else. And at this moment where, um, where the international order is fraying and where um, wars are break, uh, uh, exist in many parts of the world, and where um, where the U.S. president says, um, "Let's take the oil, let's take the mineral wealth in Afghanistan," where um, where the president of the Russian Federation defends the uh, conquest of Crimea uh, and annexation of Crimea, when um, when trade wars are being threatened, when the UN is being threatened with being defunded. Um, now more than ever, the outlawry of war must be defended. Thank you. Um, our next speaker will be David Swanson. Is there any man in this room who has not heard him inter uh, introduce yet?
Thank you, Leah. We're going to cut your pay for that. <laughs> I, I, I have been wanting people to take the Kill Out Brian Pact seriously for years um, since I wrote this book, uh, Win the World Outlawed War. And I couldn't have dreamed of a better way to take it seriously than this incredible book that uh, the internationalists that Ben is holding and that Scott has written. It's not out yet, you can't buy it yet, but I strongly recommend buying 10 copies. Um, you know, you've got to be, 10 of those would be furniture, but you can also <laughs> read them. Because, I mean, it's just absolutely invaluable. Um, the, uh, I, 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 we can, we can, discuss uh, whether Crimea was conquered and, and, yeah. and uh, whether uh, you know, Russia is the major threat to the stable, peaceful order or somebody else. But uh, I, I think that this, this history ought to be taught in every school in this country. This morning we went, Scott and I and many others, some of you went and handed out flyers uh, near Col Kellogg Boulevard in St. Paul, and we encountered very few, I myself couldn't find a one, person who knew why it was called Kellogg Boulevard. Um, Frank Kellogg was, you know, a hero in the way that a whistleblower is a hero. Uh, he was a Secretary of State who had contempt for peace activists until peace activism became too powerful, too mainstream, too irresistible. Then Kellogg changed his view, as he should have, uh, and he's to be credited for it, and he helped create the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And, as uh, Scott's noted uh, in his book, orchestrated a nasty and dishonest campaign to get himself a Nobel Peace Prize rather than allowing the prize to go to Salman Levinson, the activist who had initiated and led the movement to outlaw war. The pact is still on the books, still the supreme law of the land. It explicitly and clearly bans all war unless you choose to interpret it, as indeed did some senators who ratified it, and, and as Scott just told you, though you won't find it in the words on the wall over there, mm -hmm. uh, it, it, that as silently permitting, without defining, defensive war. Or unless you claim that it was overturned by the creation of the United Nations Charter, which thereby legalized both defensive war and war authorized by the United Nations, which is the opposite of what most people think the UN Charter did. Or unless you claim, and this is more common than you might think, that because war exists, a law forbidding war is therefore invalidated. Try telling a police officer that because you were speeding, the law against speeding is now invalidated. Um, there are in fact numerous wars underway, now author not authorized by the UN, and by definition with at least one party not fighting defensively. The U.S. bombings in eight countries in the past eight years have all been illegal under the U.N. Charter. First strike bombings of impoverished countries halfway around the globe are the antithesis of anybody's definition of defensive. And the notion that the U.N. authorized attacking Afghanistan or some country other than Iraq, which most people are aware it did refuse to authorize, is just urban myth. The authorization on Libya was to prevent a massacre that was never threatened, not to overthrow the government. Its use for the latter resulted in the UN's refusal on Syria. The notion that Iraq, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen, or the Philippines can authorize a foreign military to make war on its own people can be debated, but is nowhere articulated in the Peace Pact or in the UN Charter. The so-called responsibility to protect is merely a concept. Whether or not you agree with me that it is a hypocritical and imperialist concept, it's not to be found in any laws. So if we just want to point to a law that current wars violate, why not point to one that people have heard of, namely the UN Charter? Why dust off a law that sits somewhere between the first they ignore you and the then they laugh at you stages of progress? First and foremost, this is, why, this is what they wanted done to war. They wanted war and preparations for war, including weapons dealing, ended and replaced by the rule of law, by conflict prevention, by dispute resolution, by moral and economic and individual punishment and ostracism. The notion that they generally believed ratifying the pact would on its own end all war is as factual as Columbus's belief in a flat earth. Um, so again, it does not say in its words uh, or in any uh, formal reservation past that it permits any kind of war. This was an interpretation of many senators, many people, common understanding, and the general inability to think otherwise. 
Uh, the Outlawists movement was an uncomfortably large coalition, but one that refused to compromise on the outlawing of all war, which is likely how most of the key activists viewed the very clear language of the pact, but also likely how much of the public then viewed it. The Outlawists' arguments were very often moral ones, in a manner much less common in today's cynical and advertising-saturated world in which activists have been conditioned to appeal only to selfish interests. Whatever you make of the wisdom or the actual presence of defensive war thinking in the 20s, we cannot today survive it. Defensive or just war thinking permits the military spending that kills first and foremost by diverting resources from human, human and environmental needs. Tiny fractions of military spending could end hunger, unclean water, various diseases, even the use of fossil fuels worldwide. A theoretical just war would have to be so just as to outweigh decades of this murderous diversion of resources as well as all the blatantly unjust wars it has been generating, as well as the ever-increasing risk of nuclear apocalypse created by the institution of war, not to mention the damage that institution does to the natural environment, civil liberties, domestic policing, representative government, etc. This is too big a, a burden for any justness in any just war. An additional reason to remember kellogg Briand is to understand its historical significance, uh, which Scott has just uh, laid out for you and which his book does brilliantly. Um, prior to the pact, war was understood as legal and acceptable. Since, it has generally been considered illegal and barbaric unless waged by the United States. <laughs> that, that exception is part of why calculations that claim war has dramatically diminished in recent decades seem to me mistaken, at least overstated. Other parts of why that is include what seem to be faulty casualty counts and other slanted uses of statistics. Regardless of whether you think that war is, as some forms of violence pretty clearly are, diminishing, we need to recognize a particular problem and identify creative tools for dealing with it. I'm speaking of the U.S. government's addiction to war. Since World War II, the U.S. military has killed some 20 million people, overthrown at least 36 governments, interfered in at least 82 foreign elections, but not in the bad Russian way, attempted to assassinate over 50 foreign leaders, and dropped bombs on people in over 30 countries. This extravaganza of criminal killing is documented at davidswanson.org slash war list. In last year's Republican primaries, a debate moderator asked a candidate if he would be willing to kill hundreds and thousands of innocent children. Last week, US media voices were outraged by a White House announcement that henceforth it would fight on only one side of the war in Syria, a war that the head of the US <laughs> Special Operations last week said was clearly illegal for the US to be in. When people want to legalize torture, or lawless imprisonment, or human rights for corporations, they appeal to marginalia in court rulings, in court proceedings, uh, overturned vetoes, all sorts of nonsense that isn't law. Why not hold up a law that is on the side of peace? Veterans for Peace here in the Twin Cities has led the way on this project, getting support for the pact into the congressional record and Frank Kellogg Day proclaimed by the city council four years ago. Here's another idea. Why not get non-party states around the world to sign onto the kellogg Briand Pact? Or get existing parties to restate their commitment and demand compliance? Or why not create a global movement to replace or reform the United Nations and the International Criminal Court and the World Court with truly global democratic bodies capable of requiring compliance with the rule of law by all the usual nations of the world, plus the United States as well. We have the means of creating a global body representing local populations in proportion to population. We are not limited to a collection of nations as the means of overcoming nationalism. Robert Jackson, the chief US prosecutor at the trials of the Nazis for war and related crimes held in Nuremberg, Germany following World War II, set a standard for the world, basing his prosecution squarely on the Kellogg-Briand Pact. Quote, the wrongs which we seek to condemn and punish, he said, have been so calculated, so malignant, and so devastating that civilization cannot tolerate their being ignored because it cannot survive their being repeated. Jackson explained that this was not victor's justice, making clear that the United States would itself submit 
to similar trials if it were ever forcibly compelled to do so following an unconditional surrender. And uh, quote, if certain acts of, viol of violation of treaties are crimes, they are crimes whether the United States does them or whether Germany does them, he said. And we are not prepared to lay down a rule of criminal conduct against others which we would not be willing to have invoked against us, mm. end quote. As the outlawists and their allies ever since have sought to make Woodrow Wilson's war to end all war propaganda reality, we ought to try to do the same with Jackson's propaganda. We ought to try to make that reality. And when Ken Burns produces a documentary and opens it by calling the American war on Vietnam a war begun in good faith, we ought to have reached a point in our cultural evolution where we can immediately recognize both a lie and an impossibility. We do not talk about rapes that were begun in good faith. We do not talk about child abuse that was begun in good faith. We do not talk about slavery that was begun in good faith. If someone tells you a war was begun in good faith, make a good faith effort to destroy your television. <laughs> We've got war all wrong. The primary way that war kills is not with any weapons, but by wasting about $2 trillion a year globally on wars and primarily on preparations for wars. About $30 billion a year would end starvation on Earth. Another $11 billion provide the world clean water. A global investment in sustainable agriculture and green energy would begin to dent the military budget and to reduce the deaths caused by climate change. Don't get me wrong, war also kills with weapons. War rivals infectious disease as a cause of morbidity and mortality. 85 to 90 percent of the deaths are civilian by anyone's definition. The American Public Health Association calls militarism a public health threat. War is sporadic in human history, mostly absent from prehistory and unrecognizable in its current form from just a few centuries back. Intense conditioning is required and higher suicide rates result. There is nothing natural about war. And the first case of PTSD from war deprivation has yet to be discovered. War generates enemies rather than eliminating them. Nonviolent alternatives are more effective even against the most menacing evil. War is a top destroyer of the natural world. No other institution consumes remotely as much oil as the military. War is the basis for eliminating our civil liberties, and the only beneficiaries of dumping the weapons on local police are the weapons makers. A University of Massachusetts study makes clear that other spending and even tax cuts would create more jobs than military spending. There is no upside. As Benjamin Franklin said, there never was a good war or a bad peace.